welcome back everyone who is following the senior for physics for the current electricity topic this is part seven and we are dealing with electric cells still me your host Mandy Dennis of Serena Christian High School we want to look at electric cells by definition, an electric cell is a device that is capable of producing electric energy from chemical reactions. So it can generate electricity from chemical reactions or it can produce EMA from chemical reactions. So an electric cell is thus a source of electrical energy or EMF. And sources of electrical energy generally include, it's supposed to be electrical. Um, sources of electrical energy include cells we have to start with we have electric cells and and for them they develop their EMF from chemical reactions so that's a cell converts chemical energy to electrical energy and cells are the most common sources of EMFs in daily life like in your torch um, you have you have dry cells those are cells we have accumulators, and some of you are common. You are commonly used to the term batteries. The batteries, like the ones in the car, the car batteries, they as the accumulators. For example, accumulators consist of many cells connected together. Hence, their EMF also develops from chemical reactions. Accumulators are are batteries. They are they are, they are called batteries, and a battery is a group of cells connected together. Number three. We can also get EMF or electricity from generators, and these are AC, that is alternating current, or DC, that's direct current generators. So we generators. So we have AC and DC generators, and in generators, EMF is acquired from electromagnetic induction. Yeah, our next chapter shall explore the production of, of electricity by electromagnetic induction. So when there is a change in the magnetic flux linkage, EMF is generated or is induced. So we have thermocouples. A thermocouple is a combination of two different metals or wires joined together with their junctions kept at different temperatures. So you'll have two wires joined, but the two junctions will be kept at different temperatures. And this sets up an EMF between the two junctions. And therefore the current flows. This effect is called the thermoelectric effect. Thermocouples convert heat energy to electrical energy. Because by the fact that the two points are different temperatures, that means there is uh there, there is um being at different uh, different temperatures means that there is flow of heat. And so the conversion of the of of the heat energy into electrical energy is what we are calling the thermoelectric effect thermoelectric effect note a group of thermocouples together is called a thermopile number five we have what we call photocells as sources of electricity also so sources of emf so the photocells generate emf from photoelectric effect and the photocell converts light energy to electric energy or to electrical energy it's better you write this as electrical energy okay let's look at a simple cell a simple cell is made by dipping a copper plate which will be the the anode and a zinc plate which is the cathode in the sulfuric acid which is the electrolyte and then connecting the plates by a conductor now i want you to pay special and very keen attention here for all cells that we're going to talk about, you just have to identify the anode, which is a positive plate, identify the cathode, which is the negative plate, and then also identify the electrolyte that is used. So that's what we consider basically at all level. You have to understand what it's made up of. The simple cell or a simple cell produces electrical energy from the chemical reactions between the zinc plate and dilute sulfuric acid. Now, remember we are having two plates dipping, dipping into the sulfuric acid. I'm going to illustrate that shortly. 
But if you look at copper, copper, a copper plate and a zinc plate, in chemistry you learnt about uh, the electrochemical, the electro electrochemical series, electro or electro. I think that that's the reactivity series, if you remember, for the metals. And I think on the list of on the top of the list is uh, is uh, potassium. So the list has potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc, iron, tin, lead, hydrogen, copper, mercury, silver, and gold. Now you realize that zinc is higher; it's more reactive than copper, according to the way I've just mentioned them. So when a wire is connected between the copper plate and the zinc plate, electrons will flow from the zinc plate through the wire to the copper plate and the current flows from the copper plate to the zinc plate. You better pause and first listen again. You can rewind this. I'm moving very fast because I have to make these videos as short as possible. But you're free to rewind and listen over and over again and internalize, internalize the concepts properly. Okay. So action of a simple cell. Uh, let me start with this. Let me start with this. There's uh, um, just some setup I made here. I hope it will help you understand. A simple cell, basically, this is how we set it up. Here we have a beaker or a container in which we are going to pour sulfuric acid. This is the electrolyte. And for a simple cell, the electrolyte that we use is sulfuric acid. Dilute sulfuric acid, not concentrated. And so we dip in a copper plate. Copper is like brownish, yes. So we have a copper plate dipping in. That is going to make the, the anode positive plate. And we have a zinc plate. A zinc plate. And so you connect them. So once you connect, so you have your simple cell. The simple cell is complete. If you put here a galvanometer, I realize that it will deflect, showing that current is flowing. Or if you connect a bulb here, if you connect a bulb here, it will light, showing that the current is flowing. So this is a copper plate. We have a zinc plate here. And then the electrolyte is the dilute sulfuric acid. So um, action of a simple cell. This is, uh, we've just mentioned this. Now, I want you to look at this. Our zinc plate is the cathode and the copper plate is the is the anode or the positive plate so because zinc and copper are different in their reactivity zinc is more reactive than copper so the zinc will react with the with the sulfuric acid with the dilute sulfuric acid it will dissolve now it will dissolve when it dissolves into the sulfuric acid it will form uh, it, it when it dissolves it will form zinc ions. So those zinc ions are positively charged. That means electrons are lost. Those electrons which are lost will be able to, they will flow through the wire here. You see, this is the flow of electrons. The electrons are going to flow through the wire. And when they flow, they flow to the positive plate, which is the copper plate. Now, um, sulfuric acid, Actually, as you know very well, that sulfuric acid, it, this is dilute sulfuric acid. So when you break down the ions, it has hydrogen ions, hydroxyl ions. The hydrogen ions um, will pick up the electrons here and will form hydrogen gas at the copper plate. And that defect is called depolarization, as we shall look at it later. Now, something very important for you to note is that you have to remember that electrons flow from the negative plate to the positive plate, but the conventional direction of flow of electricity is from the positive plate to the negative plate. Please note that. I've already talked about this. Zinc dissolves in the acid because it's more reactive than copper, leaving behind electrons which pass through the wire to the copper plate. I've already explained this. We're just writing. Yeah. And the little sulfuric acid ionizes in solution or in water, forming hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions are repelled or displaced by the zinc ions in solution and they move towards the copper plate where they receive the incoming electrons from the zinc plate. Now, bubbles of hydrogen 
hydrogen gas are seen being formed around the copper plate. Therefore, current flows from the copper plate to the zinc plate through the wire. This current can be detected by the galvanometer. Note, when a simple cell is not working, it's said to be in an open circuit and its EMF is measured by connecting a voltmeter across the terminals. The EMF of a simple cell is about 1 volt. Something very important for you to note, the EMF of a simple cell is 1 volt. What are the faults or the defects in a simple cell? They are basically two. The first one is what we call polarization. The second one is called local action. Polarization, local action. Polarization, local action. What is polarization? Polarization is the formation of hydrogen bubbles on the copper plate, which prevents the electrolyte from reaching the copper plate and it reduces the flow of current. Now remember, as we've just described just a few uh, minutes ago, we said that hydrogen ions will, fl will move towards the copper plate and they receive the electrons which will have moved through the wire to the copper plate. And so they will, they will form, they will form when, they co uh, when, when the hydrogen ions combine with electrons, they will form hydrogen atoms which will combine to form a diatomic gas that is the hydrogen gas. So the bubbles of hydrogen will form on the copper plate. That formation of hydrogen bubbles on the copper plate is what we call polarization. So if you're asked to define polarization, just say it's the formation of hydrogen bubbles on the copper plate. And what, why is it bad? It's because it prevents the electrolyte from reaching the copper plate. It will, it will obstruct the electrolyte from reaching the copper plate and it reduces the flow of the current. The hydrogen layer weakens the current flow for two reasons. Number one, it lowers the EMF of the cell. And number two, it insulates or it covers the copper plate and hence increases the internal resistance of the cell. Now, how do we prevent or correct polarization in a simple cell? Part A, we can use a depolarizer. A depolarizer, commonly we use potassium dichromate, which is added to the solution, which is the acid, the electrolyte. And the potassium dichromate oxidizes the hydrogen formed to form water and the simple cell therefore will continue working. You can also do the vigorous brushing of the copper plate using a small paint brush. Pull it out and then use a small paint brush and then you brush it vigorously to take the hydrogen bubbles off and place it back. So you, can, you will have done some correction. But the prevention is by using the potassium dichromate. I want you to note this. Potas the, the potassium dichromate is a depolarizer. So once you add it to the electrolyte, which is the acid, it will prevent. But to correct, you can use... You actually, to correct, you can use both. This is not corrective. This is, just, this is not preventive. Roman 2 is just corrective, not preventive. Okay, what is local action? Local action is the dissolution of the zinc plate due to the impurities in the zinc plate, which will set up tiny local cells. Now, local action occurs when a cell is not working. A cell is just there, there but when the zinc plate has impurities in it, there will be tiny cells which will continue, which will make the zinc plate to be eaten away, in quotes. You can put this out in quotes. So you can just say dissolving of the zinc plate due to the impurities in the zinc plate. So those impurities set up tiny local cells. So we repeat by saying local action is the dissolving of the zinc plate due to the presence of impurities in it. Full stop. And those impurities will set up tiny local cells. When the zinc used is impure, bubbles of hydrogen will be seen forming off the zinc plate. This is because the impurities such as iron or carbon set up tiny local cells at the zinc surface and the bubbles of the hydrogen are given off from the impurities. And the zinc slowly dissolves in the acid, thus the zinc plate is wasted. So that that kind of that, that defect which occurs even when the cell is not working is lock action and it occurs because the zinc is impure.
So how do you prevent local action? Number one, um, you can use uh, amalgamated zinc. We can say local action is prevented by cleaning zinc in sulfuric acid. You first clean it in sulfuric acid and then you rub it with the mercury. Over. You rub, you rub mercury over the zinc surface. The, the sulfuric acid was just to clean. It just cleans and then you rub mercury over the zinc surface, which is now clean, using cotton wool. The mercury dissolves pure zinc out of the impure zinc plate and forms a bright coating of the zinc amalgam over the surface of the zinc plate. Now, the zinc amalgam now covers the impurities. On the other hand, you can use just use pure zinc plates, not the impure ones, just to prevent local action. Okay, we have another type. Uh, okay. We are looking at cells now. We have a simple cell. We've looked at the simple cell. Uh, now we also have what we call the Leclanchy cells. Leclanchy cell. A Leclanchy cell uh, can be categorized in... Leclanchy cells are categorized into two. We have what we call the dry ones and the wet ones. We have the dry cells and the wet cells. The dry Leclanchy cells, these are the common ones that you have at home, that you've been using in the laboratories. And then we have the wet ones, wet cells. These, these, these are rare, actually. They are very rare. You can Google and then have a look at one. I can't put everything in the video. Let's look at the dry Leclanchy cell. So it consists of the carbon rod. Carbon rod is the anode, and the zinc can is the cathode. It has a carbon rod and a zinc can. What we're calling the dry Leclanchy cell is the common dry cell. The, the, the Daniel cells that we have, those the tiger heads, the ones that you have at home. Those are the dry cells we're talking about. So the positive electrode is a carbon rod. And the negative electrode is the zinc can. It's a can. And then the electrolyte is ammonium chloride jelly. So we use a jelly. It's like it's like a um, some kind of Vaseline. Actually, if you split open a dry cell, you see that thing which is sticky. That 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 kind of uh, uh, that that's like porridge, eh? like mbocha. That mbocha thing is is the ammonium chloride jelly. And and, and it works as the electrolyte. So I told you for all the cells, you have to understand the anode, understand the cathode, and also remember the electrolyte. The rest of the issues are going to be very easy for you. Uh-huh. Now, it's just a simplified diagram. I hope you're able to see it well. Um, here is the, this is what we call the carbon rod. It's always black, carbon rod. Um, actually, I request you to get a dry cell and open it, but be careful. Be very careful. Yes, we have a carbon rod. Um, then we have a mixture. Around it, we have a mixture of powdered carbon and manganese dioxide. And now, the electrolyte in which it rests, this electrolyte is the ammonium chloride jelly. It's a jelly. Um, the, the carbon rod is the... Is the is the anode is the positive the positive it just has a brass contact here don't worry about this and then after that we have a can this is the zinc can the whole of this is the zinc can this is a zinc can here the zinc can acts as the anode uh, as the cathode the negative plate and the contact the negative contact is here and we have, basically, we have an insulating cover here. No big deal. So, the electrolyte in a dry cell is the ammonium chloride jelly. Please, it's not a solution. It's a jelly. And the ammonium chloride jelly is prevented from drying up by sealing the top of the cell with a metal disc. You can, you can, you, you, you understand what I'm talking about. And the zinc can serves as the cathode. The zinc can serves as a cathode and also as a container while the carbon rod is the anode. The chemical reactions between zinc and ammonium chloride is a source of energy in a dry cell. As a result, hydrogen gas is produced which collects at the carbon rod and 
polarizes a cell. So polarization still takes place here, but there is a depolarizer. So the polarization in a dry cell is corrected or minimized by the manganese dioxide around the carbon rod, which acts as the depolarizer. So dry cells slowly run down or deteriorate even when not in use because of the local action which cannot entirely be prevented. Now here you can't keep pulling out the carbon rod and, 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 and maybe rubbing it with mercury. No, you can't do that. Um, so here local action can't be, prov can't be uh, prevented. That's why dry cells slowly run down even when they're in shops. You may find after some time when they do not work. Because the zinc can will have been eaten away. Yeah. And I want you to note this. They may ask you, if we go back to our diagram, they may ask you, the use of the powder the carbon. Why do we have, we have a carbon rod and then we have powder the carbon. Why? So the powder the carbon is just to, to increase the surface area of the anode. Remember the anode is made up, made up of carbon. So the powder the carbon here will increase the surface area of the anode. Okay, back to where we were. Now, the wet leg lynch cell. This is this is the setup. Wet leg lynch cells are very delicate. I think that's why they are really in they are not even in use currently. But you can you can also make your own if you have the materials. So basically, um we have the ammonium chloride, but this here we use a solution. It's wet, therefore we're using a solution. For the dry cell, we use a jelly. The electrolyte is a jelly, ammonium chloride jelly, but here we're using ammonium chloride solution. And still, look at this. The carbon rod here makes the anode. And we have it here, we are going to use a zinc rod to make the cathode, it's a zinc rod. And, and, and we have a mixture of carbon and manganese dioxide, just like in a dry cell, contained in a porous pot. A porous pot. And you know, it has to be porous because ions have to flow here. And there is a vent which will allow the hydrogen to keep moving out. This is just a glass jar. So, a wet lake lynch cell consists of, a, of of the anode as carbon, a carbon rod surrounded by a depolarizing mixture of manganese dioxide and carbon in a porous pot. I told you the, the use of the carbon is to increase the surface area for the action of the anode. The zinc rod acts as the cathode. Both the zinc rod and the porous pot are placed inside a glass jar containing a solution of ammonium chloride which acts as the electrolyte which acts as electrolyte. When the carbon rod is connected to the zinc rod by a conductor or a wire, current flows from the carbon rod from the carbon rod to the zinc outside through the wire, that's the current, and from the zinc to the carbon inside, inside. So as the zinc reacts with ammonium chloride, electrons flow from the zinc to the carbon. The polarization caused by hydrogen is prevented by manganese dioxide, which oxidizes oxygen to water. It will so the we are saying the, the polarization caused by hydrogen is prevented by manganese dioxide. The manganese dioxide it will facilitate the, the, the oxidization of hydrogen to water. So the hydrogen is not supposed to be oxygen. It will it will oxidize the hydrogen to water. Please make that correction. This is not oxygen but hydrogen. Note a wet like lynch cell has an EMF of 1.5 volts. And the main disadvantage with this cell is that the depolarizing action is slow and the EMF is easily reduced. This is because when a large current is taken from the cell, more hydrogen is produced than it's oxidized by the manganese dioxide. If the cell is allowed to rest for some time, however, the depolarizing action continues to completion and the original, original EMF is restored. These cells are rare today, like, like I've already told you, and have been replaced by dry cells. 
Second note, the carbon powder increases the conducting surface area of the carbon rod, which I already talked about. Now, common questions come from here. What are the advantages of the wet like lynch cell over the simple cell? We're going to compare the three cells. We started with a simple cell, we looked at a dry cell, and now we've just looked at a wet cell. So what are the advantages of the wet like lynch cell over the simple cell? Number one, the wet cell contains manganese dioxide for oxidizing hydrogen so as to prevent polarization. A wet cell has a depolarizing agent. Yeah? But the simple cell doesn't. So that's an advantage. Number two, a wet cell contains carbon powder which reduces the internal resistance and increasing increases the conducting surface area actually of the anode. So uh, but for the simple cell it doesn't. Okay, now what are the disadvantages of the wet cell, wet like lynch cell? We said it has a slow depolarizing action. And if the cell is working, the EMF drops easily. It's bulky, like really bulky. Yeah, very bulky. It has a risk of the electrolyte pouring out. You saw that glass. Yeah, so there's a risk of the electrolyte pouring out. And it cannot maintain a steady current. What are the advantages of a dry cell over a wet cell? Now, the dry one over the wet cell. Oh, very nice dry cell. It's very simple, very small, and very portable. It's supposed to be ARA, with an ARA here, yeah. It's small sized and portable. Please put an ARA here. <laughs> you put an ARA, P-O-R-T-A-B-L-E. Yes, uh, dry cells are small sized and portable as compared to wet cells, and they have faster depolarizing actions. A dry cell can maintain a high steady current for some period of time as compared to a wet cell. And the electrolyte cannot pour out. Remember, it's a jelly. It's sticky. Yeah. So, now, we want to categorize our cells. We have talked about cells. There are still more cells to talk about. But now, all cells lie into two major categories. They are either primary or secondary. So a primary cell is one in which current or EMF is produced as a result of non-reversible chemical reactions. Note that, that the chemical reactions that occur or that produce EMF in a primary cell, they are non-reversible. They occur once in one direction. They are non-reversible. In other words, a primary cell is a cell that cannot be recharged after running down like the dry cells that you have at home. Once they are used, they can never be recharged. You don't recharge them. Those are called the primary cells. Primary cells is one that cannot be recharged after running down. Examples of primary cells include the simple cell that we had, a dry cell, a wet cell. These are all primary cells. Once used, they can never be used again. Now, a secondary cell, on the other hand, is one in which EMF is produced as a result of reversible chemical reactions or chemical changes. Um, can, you use, can you give me the alternative definition for a secondary cell? Remember, we said the primary cell, its second definition, we say the primary cell is one which cannot be recharged after running down. What about a secondary cell? Come on. Okay, you must have thought about it. A secondary cell can also be defined as a cell which can be recharged after running down. Secondary cells are also called storage cells and they make accumulators. They accumulators. We're going to look at accumulators later. Examples of secondary cells include we have lead acid cells which form lead acid accumulators. We have the nickel iron, the, the nickel cadmium, or we can have the nickel iron cell, or they are commonly called the alkaline cells. This is nickel iron. Ni is nickel, Fe is, this is ferrium, which is iron. Nickel iron cell. Or you can find NiCd, which is nickel 
cadmium cell. Yes. Now, this is what we call a lead acid accumulator, which you call a car battery. Car battery. Um, you've seen these batteries before in your cars at home. They are everywhere. You've seen them. So, this one here is a battery. It has very many cells. I, I can see how many compartments here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six of them compartments here. So, that means there are six cells here. And, and the whole of this setup is what we call, the whole of this, uh, whatever you call it, is what we call an accumulator, a lead acid accumulator. Now, a lead acid accumulator, if you are to look at its inside, I've tried it already, I think I hope you'll be able to understand it. Breaking down cell by cell, let's just consider this portion here only this portion here you realize that inside we have a brownie plate brownie plate this is the the anode and then we have the cathode this is lead dioxide then we have lead lead dioxide is brown and lead is 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 gray in color so <clears throat> the lead four oxide or lead dioxide forms the anode and the lead forms the cathode. And you see, because there are many, all these cells are identical. There is this one, one, two, three, four, five, six. They are connected to form the lead acid accumulator. They all have holes for a process I will not mention now. Now I will tell you why these holes are important later. So at uh, the negative terminals, you see they are all connected, this connected to this one, connected to this one. They are all connected. And also the positive terminals are also connected. And the outlets are here. The outlets are here. Okay. Yes. Now, this, this is uh, the detail of one cell. The negative terminal, uh, the negative plate or the negative plate which we call the cathode is, is the lead plate and the lead dioxide plate here is, is the anode. The electrolyte we use here is dilute sulfuric acid. That's why we call this a lead acid accumulator. This is a lead acid cell. Or when you combine many of them together, you end up with a lead acid accumulator. It's a lead acid cell. A lead acid cell consists of a positive plate of brown lead dioxide and a negative plate of gray lead with the lead sulfuric acid as the electrolyte. And when fully charged, its CMF is 2.2 volts. And its relative density or the, the relative density of the acid as measured by a hydrometer is 1.25. Now during this charge, when supplying current, the acid becomes more dilute, thus the relative density falls to about 1.15 and the EMF falls to 1.8 volts at full discharge. These figures vary with different makes of the cell. The relative density of the acid should be checked and the cell recharged. And when the cell is discharging or giving out current, both plates change to lead sulfate, which is white. The lead acid accumulators are used as car and lorry batteries. Okay. This part is so common. So, so common because it's practical. How do you care for the lead acid accumulator? What's the maintenance? What are the tips that you have to know for it to last for a long time? Number one, the level of the sulfuric acid in the lead acid cell, lead acid accumulator actually should be checked regularly and any loss, any loss through evaporation evaporation replaced using distilled water. So whenever you check the level of the dilute sulfuric acid and you realize that it has reduced, you replace using distilled water. Please, please, please never add the acid except in cases of spillage. And this is because during loss by evaporation, it's only the water which is lost, not the acid. So, point number two. How do we care and how do we 
maintain the lead acid accumulator. It must be charged regularly and never be left in an uncharged condition for a long time. When not in use, the lead acid accumulator should be given a top up, what we call topping up charge, at least once a month. If you're not using it, once a month, just go and charge it and then place it back. You shouldn't leave it in an uncharged state for a long time. Roman 3, or the third point, when charging or when fully charged, no naked flame should be near because the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen gases evolved are dangerously explosive. Now, when you're charging, be very careful. When you're charging, or uh, a lead acid accumulator, what you call the car battery, or when it's fully charged, you shouldn't have a naked flame around. Don't put it near a sigiri, a charcoal stove. Yeah, you will just see fire, fire. Or... So when the accumulator is, <clears throat> is fully charged, hydrogen is freely evolved from the negative plates and oxygen from the positive plates. That's why we had the other holes there for letting those gases out. That process is called gassing. Yeah. Roman 4, we are saying it should never be over discharged or shorted. So, connecting a wire directly across the terminals, please, 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 I want you to note this. Note this carefully. Don't just connect the terminals directly, a wire. You connect the negative plate and the positive plate directly like that. That is shorting short circuiting it's not good you're going to you're going to damage the plates actually here because when a large current flows through them the 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 lead the lead the the, the coating actually of the chemicals that make up the, the lead oxide which is on the the lead oxide lead four oxide lead dioxide which is the the anode is actually not just a plate, it's a compound that is contained in a certain kind of way. There is a way they arrange it. Now, it, when you allow a large current to flow through it, it will fall off and you will damage the battery. You can even make it explode. Number five, it should not be left in a discharged state for a long time. This is because the lead sulfate on the plates changes to lead sulfate crystals. And the crystals are not convertible to lead and lead dioxide. And this will make the cell or the battery no longer chargeable or rechargeable. The formation of lead sulfate crystals on the plate is called sulfating. And so we say that the cell is sulfated. Number six, when charging, use a small current of about three amperes. Do not be tempted to use a very high charging current. The charging current charge the battery until gassing starts or until the gas is freely given off number seven leave the tops of the tops of the cells oh okay this is the tops of sorry of the cells or at least you have to leave the tops of the cells this is true you remove this is okay Remove the tops of the cells from each cell. You have to remove. Let me show you the tops. Uh, please come on faster, faster. Yes, you have to remove these ones. Yeah, we are saying remove them. Remove them when you are charging. We were on number seven. Come on, number seven. Okay, we are saying. Remove or leave the tops off. That's removing the top tops, or at least loosen them while charging, so that the gas produced when the cell is fully charged can escape. And number eight, use a hydrometer to check the to check the relative density of the electrolyte in each cell, and recharge it to a level of one point two five. Please check every cell separately, and do not keep it on a bare floor but on an insulator such as a wooden material. Why do you think we should not leave it on a bare floor? Why do you think we should not leave it on a bare floor, but on an insulator? Please, you should explain this. Hmm? 
explain it i'll talk about it um no i'll not talk about it actually you will forward me the answer okay now what are the advantages of lead lead acid accumulators over dry cells of all simple cells or wet cells number one remember their secondary charge cells let us the accumulator can be recharged its emf is higher than that of a dry cell or a simple cell the dry cell has an emf of 1.5 i think you've read that those marks even a wet cell has 1.5 volts a simple cell has 1.0 volts the lead acid cell just one has 2.2 .2. on average it's two just when it's normal use it's two volts that's why, because there are six, you always find a battery said to have uh, a, an EMF of 12 volts. And a lead acid accumulator can work for a long time, longer time than the dry cell or a simple cell. And its, it's internal resistance is lower than that of a dry cell. Disadvantages of the lead acid accumulators, they are very heavy because they contain too, too much lead. Lead is heavy, my friend. It actually is, I think it's the, the, the most dense material on earth is lead. I hope so. Um, you can, I stand to be corrected. It cannot produce a high current without damaging the plates and causing the active materials to fall off. By the way, that's why I told you that you shouldn't just connect the negative terminal and positive terminal directly, the shorting. Once you do that, you will damage the plate and you will cause the active materials to fall off. Not one. This is a very important note. Now look at this. When you multiply 1.5 times 8, you get 12. But if you add dry cells, 8 of them together in series, you cannot start a car. While a battery, a lead acid accumulator of 12 volts, can start the car. Why? The reason is because the dry cells, eight of them, when you put them in series, they will have a very high internal resistance. And yet the internal resistance of the lead acid accumulator is very low compared to the others, to, to, to the dry cells. So as a result, the battery produces the, the battery which is the the lead acid accumulator produces enough current which can start the car. As compared to the other eight dry cells, yes, they have the same EMF of 12 volts, but because of their high internal resistance, the effective internal resistance will be very high, their, their current produces is not going to be sufficient enough to start the car. You can read through these words here. Note two, lead acid accumulators are commonly used in ignition and lighting, and thus providing light in motor mod, in cars or motor cars. How do we charge an accumulator? Charging is just very simple. This is the DC. We use direct current. We use strictly direct current. You have a DC supply. You have an ammeter to show you the amount of current you're using. You have your accumulator which you're charging. You have a switch. You have a real start. All these are in series. I think you can see this very easily. You connect them in series. But the way you connect, look at this. The positive terminal, this is the positive terminal, the taller side. Positive terminal of the lead acid accumulator is connected to the positive terminal of the direct current source. And the negative to the negative. It's not the other way around. So, an accumulator is recharged by passing a direct current through it in an opposite direction. We connect the positive to positive. A negative to the negative terminal of the cell of the lead acid accumulator to the negative terminal of the charging supply the dc we are saying the positive terminal of the lead acid accumulator which is a battery is connected the, to the positive terminal of the charging supply and the negative terminal of the accumulator is connected to the negative terminal of the charging supply in a circuit this makes current to flow through the accumulator in a reverse direction a real start and anameter are connected in series with the accumulator to regulate and determine the current through the accumulator. And the leads or the tops of the cells are loosened or removed and the switch is closed. 
So the rheostat is adjusted until the ammeter reads a small current of about 3 amperes flowing through the accumulator. The current is allowed to flow until uh, takes place. This shows that the battery is now fully charged. I'm not comfortable pronouncing this. Okay, we can say the current is allowed to flow until the gases start uh, being being given off. So this shows that the battery is now fully charged. Note, um, I think I can just summarize this. Let me just show you from the diagram. Yeah. So if this is the charging source, it has EMF E1 and the EMF of the of the accumulator is E2. The effective EMF during this process is going to be E because they are opposing each other. Positive to positive, so they are opposing each other. So it will be E2, E1 minus E2. That is the effective EMF. So uh, this is the formula that we are writing here. We say that if E1 is the EMF of the DC charging supply and E2 is the EMF of the accumulator being recharged, R the internal resistance, R the internal resistance, and capital R are the resistance of the rheostat, and I be the current flowing in the circuit through the accumulator from the supply. Then the effective EMF is this. You know that very well. We already talked about those things. And from Ohm's law is equal to I into R plus R. So you can make any calculation here. But remember this is charging source E minus the EMF of the battery. So this is the current R plus R. We are small R is the internal resistance. This is the resistance of resistance of the real start. Examples. Six accumulators, each of EMF 2 volts and each of internal resistance 0.1 ohms are charged from a 24 volts DC supply as shown below, like this. Explain why it's necessary to include a real start in the circuit. Yes? Why do we need to have a real start, this real start in the circuit? Why? Okay, can you give the answer? Why is it necessary to include a real start in the circuit? Why can't we do without it? Why? Roman 2. What will the ammeter read when the real start is set to 5.4 ohms? And Roman 3. Find the rate at which electrical energy is converted to chemical energy in two above in, in this real start here. Remember, the rate of conversion of electrical energy to chemical energy is, is actually asking for the power. Yes. Oh, I'm going to do only Roman 2. <laughs> Roman 1, why is it necessary to include the real stuff? In the circuit is yours. It's a gift for you. I mean, if I don't give you a gift, I will be a very bad friend. I don't know whether there is a bad friend. So, Roman 2. Remember, we said from our formula, E is equal to I R I into R plus R. So, you need to get the effective EMF, which is the EMF of the charging source minus the EMF of the battery you're charging which is 24 minus 12, and we get 12 volts. Mm -hmm. What is the internal resistance? It was 0 0.6. And what is the resistance of the real start? We are having 5.4. In the calculation, we get I equals to 2 amperes. Very, very simple. In Roman 3, they are asking for the power. Power. Remember, power is equal to I squared R. But this total... R, total, total resistance is going to be internal resistance plus the resistance of the resistor. Because they said, they're asking for the power. the power. The rate at which the electrical energy is converted to chemical energy, that means in the cell. So you have to consider the effective EMF in the cell. Sorry, the effective internal resistance. Um, we got the current of 2, so you square it, then times the sum of the... Of the resistance of the real start plus the internal resistance. You end up with 24 watts. I still ask Roman 1. 
Why do you think we include a real start? Please, 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 I want you to tell me the answer. Why, why, why? You can pause, think about it. I've already talked about it actually even around two times. <laughs> yes, I talked about it, but indirectly. Okay. Uh, alkaline accumulators, the ones we call nickel iron cells. The, the nickel iron cells and the nickel cadmium cells form the alkaline accumulators. So an alkaline cell or a nickel iron cell or a nickel cadmium cell consists of nickel hydroxide as the positive electrode and the iron as as the negative electrode. This is nickel iron. So it has nickel hydroxide will be the anode and the iron will be the the air iron plate will be the cathode. And it uses an alkaline solution like caustic potash is potassium hydroxide. So it uses uh, potassium hydroxide, for example, as the electrolyte. That's why it's called an alkaline cell. And this is an example, just like a simple cell. Um, the, positive, the positive electrode is nickel hydroxide. The negative electrode uh, is made up of iron. And the electrolyte is the potassium hydroxide. Now, they may give you a nickel cadmium. That will be nickel hydroxide and the cadmium here forming the cathode. In comparison with lead acid accumulators, alkaline accumulators are, number one, they are lighter than the lead acid accumulators of the same electrical energy content, and they have higher internal resistance. They have higher internal resistance than the lead acid cells of the same size, and they are less efficient. Once you have higher internal resistance, what do you expect? Less efficiency. So they are not they are not harmed by rapid charging and discharging. Now for them, even when the charge the, the current flowing through them is higher, they're not easily uh, affected. So the alkaline accumulators can be recharged in a similar way like lead acid accumulators. Note a nickel cadmium cell which we call NICD is supposed to be a capital C cell is similar to a nickel iron cell except that the negative electrode in the nickel cadmium cell is cadmium instead of iron. So secondly, a nickel cadmium cell can be stored when discharging while a nickel iron cell cannot. Both the nickel iron and the nickel cadmium accumulators are called alkaline accumulators. Okay, um, another note, note, we are having notes here. Um, these alkaline accumulators, they do not deteriorate easily when in use. This is a very big advantage. And they can withstand much rougher treatment and need very little attention. They have a smaller EMF than the lead acid accumulators. So for them, their EMF is 1.25. Let's just have some simple recap. What's the EMF of, of a simple cell? It's 1.0. Okay. What's the EMF of a dry cell? 1.5. What's the EMF? All those are volts, remember. What's the EMF of a wet cell? 1.5. What's the EMF of a lead acid, a lead acid cell? Just one cell. 2.2 volts. And now what's the EMF? Of a lead of 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 an alkaline cell, an alkaline cell, a nickel iron cell, nickel cadmium cell. That's one point two five. So we are saying that these alkaline cells they have smaller EMFs than lead acid cells. That is one point two five, and their EMF can their EMFs appreciably fall during discharge. So they are more expensive than lead acid cells. And not alkaline batteries are used for emergency power supplies, for lighting in hospitals, in ships, in trains, and in cinemas. Yeah. Because actually now for them, they can, they, can, they can withstand rough handling and they need little attention. So, and they are even a little lighter. Yeah. So they can be used for emergency power supplies. 
Okay. Um, advantages of nickel iron cells or nickel cadmium cells. He said rapid charging and discharging does not harm them. They are lighter than lead acid cells. They have a longer lifespan than lead acid cells. They can be left for months in a discharged condition without harm. Now, and I want you to note this. You can add this part here. Here. Actually, here. They do not, these ones here, they do not deteriorate easily when in use. Yeah. They can even withstand much rougher treatment. Now, disadvantages of nickel iron cells. They are more expensive than lead acid cells. They have a low e lower EMF, only 1.25 volts. They have a higher internal resistance. They are less efficient and they are bulky. Hey, they are actually bulky. Hoo -hoo. Revision questions just for you, my friend. Number one. You pause and you write the question. Pause, write the question, and you answer it. I am not going to read through. But uh, the solution is here. <laughs> okay, someone thought there, there was no solution. The solution is here. Yeah, you can cross check with what you wrote. Number two. You pause and do the questions. Okay, part C, copy and complete the table below. We have a table here. You copy and complete it. Okay. Compare with your answers. Please you pause and read through. Number three, distinguish between polarization and local action in a simple cell. Explain how polarization and local action are each prevented in a simple cell. Number four, describe briefly how the following sources of electricity work. The bicycle dynamo, piezoelectricity, that's the piezoelectric effect, and the thermocouple. And photo, a photo cell or a phototube. Solutions again. Bicycle dynamo. It works on the principle that an electric current or EMF is induced in a coil or a conductor wire. When it rotates in a magnetic field, cutting the magnetic field lines. Just briefly. Once there is a change in magnetic flux linkage. So if there is a wire that can move and cut through magnetic field lines then definitely an electric current is going to be induced, what we call electromagnetic induction here. So we have piezoelectric electricity, which we call the crystal pickups. The term piezo means pressure. So in piezoelectricity, mechanical energy is converted directly to electrical energy. Materials like quartz, barium, titanate, Develop electric charges on their opposite ends. When you compress, just compress them and they develop charges. Yeah, so we end up with electricity. Thermocouple, when a highly reactive metal and a low reactive metal are connected at two junctions and the junctions are held at different temperatures, current flows through the two metals, metals or the wires and can be detected by a galvanometer. That's how a thermocouple works. And in a photocell, it works on the pr principle of photoelectric emission when radiations such as ultraviolet, the UV, 
radiation of high enough frequency strikes the cathode, electrons are ejected and move to the anode. A circuit is thus made complete and current flows in the reverse direction to that of the electrons.